it really is a pleasure to be here. I, I have retired in June, but thank you. But I do miss it. So what I'm going to talk to you about tonight is sort of rounding off what you've learned so far. I'm going to talk about muscle invasive bladder cancer and the treatments we have for that. Oh, I think I have one here. I'll just join it in. Thank you. So Dr. Morash talked to you about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, and then Dr. Ong talked about immunotherapies and work that we've been doing for muscle invasive bladder cancer. What I'd like to do now is to take it to the practical level of what we, the treatments we can offer. So these are basically overall what I'm going to talk about. Uh, look at the options, the different types of urinary diversions after cystectomy, what to expect after surgery, and then sources of support. So you've seen this in different forms in the previous two speakers, but where I'm going to be talking about is tumors that have eroded into the muscle. So this is the inside of the bladder here. This is the muscle layer. And we're going to be talking about those tumors that have moved in there. So for localized muscle invasive bladder cancer, this is cancer that's residing in the muscle, there are really two treatment options, surgery or radiation. Both of those types of treatment, though, can be enhanced by the addition of chemotherapy. In the surgical world, we can have neoadjuvant chemotherapy, which is chemo before the surgery, or you can have adjuvant chemotherapy, or adding in the immunotherapy for both, um, which is after the surgery. And for radiation, it's the same option, plus or minus chemotherapy. And I'm going to give you a little bit of information about each one. A colleague of mine gave me this, and when you think about radiation or surgery, it's the cake. It, it tastes good, but when you add chemotherapy, you've got the icing on the cake. You've really got the full picture. So what's the role of chemotherapy, whether it be with radiation or with surgery? It's us with surgery, it's usually given before the, before the surgery itself. We've, we know there are better outcomes when patients receive neoadjuvant chemotherapy because it helps to eliminate cancer cells that we can't see. We can see cancer cells on a CT scan, but we can't see them elsewhere in the body necessarily. So we know that by adding chemotherapy to that surgical practice, that clinical trials and research have shown advantages in uh, length of life and five-year survival rates. It's now the standard of care. Every patient that comes in that has a diagnosis of muscle invasive bladder cancer is comes in to see a urologist is also referred to see an oncologist. From a radiation perspective, so if a patient, I mean, most patients have a preference to keep their bladder, but some patients actually have the ability to do this by having a small, well-defined tumor and no carcinoma in situ. Dr. Morash spoke earlier about the, the lining of the bladder and that, that cells, if you have that type of cancer, radiation is not appropriate. So there's a small group of patients where radiation and chemotherapy can be appropriate, thereby sparing the bladder. Radiation and chemotherapy are also used for patients who may not be able to t tolerate major surgery. And I'm going to talk a little bit more in a minute about the surgery itself. Radiation is given once a day, five days a week, for five or six weeks in conjunction with chemotherapy. So this means a patient has got to come to the hospital either here or at the Queens by Carleton five days a week for five or six weeks. For some people that's prohibitive. It's used in combination with chemotherapy because the chemotherapy helps the uptake of the radiation. The radiation helps the uptake of the chemotherapy. It's a radiosensitizer. And we know from research that it helps improve the control of cancer in the pelvis. Now, the surgery that's done for muscle invasive bladder cancer is called a radical cystectomy. Cystectomy is the removal of the bladder, and radical means that the, the surgeon is removing organs around the bladder. And these are organs and tissues that, where the cancer may spread relatively quickly to. So we've got reproductive organs, lymph nodes, and then once that bladder is removed, we have to create a new way for the urine to be managed. And that's called a urinary diversion. There are three different urinary diversions, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each one. So you can see here we've got ileal conduit, continent reservoir pouch, and a neobladder. In many cases, this is the patient's preference in discussion with the urologist as to what the patient may choose. 
Some patients are not suitable for one or the other, but again, that's a, dis a discussion point with the urologist. So the first one from the 50s is an ileoconduit. And an ileoconduit is the surgeon will take a small piece of bowel, probably about six to eight inches long, and create really a pipe. So you'll see in the drawing, the inside end here, the kidneys and the ureters are attached to this conduit or pipe. And then the distal end, the outer end, comes out to the skin on the lower abdomen. And it actually looks like the stoma at the bottom. Some of you may know of people who've got a colostomy or an ileostomy for stool. It's the same type of stoma that you have, just located differently and a different function. The urine flows freely from the kidney through the ureter into the conduit or pipe and then out the stoma. And it's captured on your skin by a collection bag, appliance, pouch. And you can see the tan color around here. This is a sticky glue and it will stick to the, sto the skin around the stoma. These appliances or bags are changed every five to seven days and the patients will empty them four or five times a day. Okay, the second one, it's got a mouthful of a name, catheterizable continent reservoir pouch. So over time, it was felt if we can capture the urine on the outside of the body, why can't we do it on the inside? And so the surgeons developed a pouch, an internal pouch. And this is made again from intestine, but it's made from about 60 centimeters or so of intestine that's cut, folded, and made into a pouch with a bit of a chimney on it to catch the urine from the ureters, and then a bit of a pipe coming out again to a stoma. The difference between this and the ileoconduit is this stoma is continent. What that means is no urine can leak out. There's a valve in this tube that stops the urine from coming out. And in order to empty it, what a patient does is they insert a small tube, small catheter, th through the stoma, through the valve, into the pouch, and then drain the urine and take that catheter out. That catheter can be reused, and you usually drain this, this uh, pouch four to five times a day. The final development is a neobladder. And a neobladder is made similarly to the pouch, but it doesn't have a stoma. This is actually connected to the patient's urethra, so it's all internal, nothing external. So you've got the two kidneys, the ureters coming down, and they connect to a small chimney at the back of the neobladder, and then the neobladder is connected to the urethra, and the patient urinates through the urethra, similar to normal, not the same as with a native bladder. Now, the surgery itself can take anywhere from 6 to 10 hours, depending on the urologist and the, and the patient and the type of procedure that's being done. The length of stay in hospital is about 7 to 10 days. Initially, patients will stay overnight in the recovery room, or it's also known as the PACU. And this is really so patients can be monitored just to make sure they recover well from the anesthetic because of the length of time. We try to get patients moving as quick as possible, so you'll find patients are sitting on the side of the bed the first day, the second day, and they're getting up and walking in the halls with assistance. Nurses and physiotherapists are there to help out. There's a progressive return to a normal diet. There's no special diet that patients who have had a bladder removal have to, have to stick with. Pain management is paramount. We try to make sure that people are comfortable in order to be able to get up and get moving because it's that getting moving that helps people get discharged. Patients are eligible for home care services, and that will be arranged while patients are in the hospital. All patients are discharged with a clinic visit to be set up, so you'll be, have a follow-up visit in the clinic, and that's usually booked three to four weeks from the surgery date. And at that time, the urologist will discuss the surgery. They'll also talk about the pathology results of what come back from that surgical specimen. Decisions at that time are made about plan of care, ongoing follow-up, a possible referral to an oncologist if you hadn't been seen before, and future plans for blood work and imaging. Going home after surgery, people can return to a normal level of activity, but it does take three to six months for people to get their strength back. And we can say at four or five months, people can be about 80% recovered, just more from the strength and the, the ability to be moving. Nutrition, 
diet comes back very slowly. People don't feel like eating at the very beginning. And so we encourage small meals, frequent snacks. But again, appetite will return. Patients are taught the care of the urinary diversion. So whether it's an ileal conduit or a neal bladder, there are specifics that are taught before the patient leaves the hospital. Follow-up care will be arranged with your urologist. And also if patients have seen oncology, there will be follow-up appointments booked there as well. So you may be seeing two specialists. And usually with the urologist, it's every three months for a year, then every six months for three years, and then yearly after that. Patients who choose to have an ileal conduit will meet with an intrastomal therapy nurse. So this is a nurse who's specially trained in the care of stomas. She meets the patient before surgery to actually mark the place on the skin where the stoma should be. And this is to avoid any skin folds, any scarring, and to sit where clothing might sit. The intrastomal therapist will also see patients on the floor before they go home just to make sure that they're ready to go home and make sure they've got the supplies that they need. Patients must be able to empty and rinse and, man and manage the pouch before they go home. But it's the home care team that will come into the home that will actually teach patients how to manage it, how to change the appliance, and how to work with it day to day. For neobladder patients, there are, there are some specifics that patients need to know before they go home. One of them is the importance of hydration. When the piece of bowel that's made, made into the neobladder our bowels make mucus to help our stool slide through. The bowel becoming a neobladder still makes that mucus. So when a patient has a catheter in, we want to make sure that the mucus is flushed through and doesn't block the catheter. So we encourage patients to drink at least two liters of fluid a day. Now that's a lot, but it's important to keep flushing the kidneys through and to keep flushing that neobladder. Patients are taught how to care for a catheter because patients go home with a catheter that remains in until that first post-operative appointment. It's not there forever, just for the first three to four weeks. They're also taught how to flush that catheter at home. So three to four times during the day, they're taught how to irrigate it to make sure that there's no mucus buildup and the urine flows smoothly through it. In preparation for learning how to retrain the new bladder, Patients are taught how to do Kegel exercises or pelvic floor exercises, and women will know about those after childbirth. It's really to help strengthen the pelvic floor, to help develop some continence with the new bladder. And then we talk about a new, new way to urinate. It's not the same as with a native bladder, so there's some training that's required there as well. And that training starts primarily in the clinic after the catheter has been removed. With all... The care for muscle invasive bladder cancer, the biggest thing is the decision making that's required. Chemotherapy, uh, surgery versus radiation, the type of diversion that patients have. So we really encourage connections with peer support and Bladder Cancer Canada, who you've met some of the representatives here today, are a great group of patients and people who've been through this you know, and really beneficial for a patient who is trying to decide on what to do to talk to somebody who's been through it. So we were always trying to connect patients with representatives from the local group to make sure that they had someone to talk about their experiences. We can do the medical side and the nursing side and talk about what will happen and what may happen, but it's really beneficial to talk to somebody who's actually been through it. So education support is very important for patients going through all of this. Uh, Preoperative preparation, recovery after surgery, the type of care that's required at home, sexuality, erectile function, all impacted by bladder cancer, and the surgeries. And then what to expect when you go home, the normal versus abnormal. You've been fine in the hospital, you go home, something happens. You don't know whether that's normal or whether that's something that you should be calling the doctor about. So that, all that type of information is discussed as well. Because of all the decision making and the lengthy surgery, the lengthy process, really Going forward, you need to be kind to yourself and be patient. It takes a long time to recover from the surgery, but people do. And you can meet people here today who've had the surgery and have recovered and come out the other side, and you wouldn't know they'd had surgery. Accept help from others. Keep a sense of humor. When you're trying to deal with the continence issues after a neobladder, all you can do is try and have a sense of humor. Ask questions. Everybody has said to you today, make sure that if you don't know, ask. Bring people with you, list your questions. It's always good to have something written down. 
I mentioned earlier it may take three to six months to, to reach a new normal, and that really is true. So don't despair if after you've gone, you're going through this procedure and if after this, two months down the road, you're still feeling tired, you still don't have the energy, you're still incontinent, still learning how to use a neobladder. And support groups can be so strong. Not everybody is a support group type of person, but just knowing that there's people there that have been through what you're going through or that can answer your questions is really important. We have two in our area. We've got Bladder Cancer Canada, but we also have our Ottawa Ostomy group. For those patients who choose to have an ileal conduit, we have a group there that can provide resources and information. They have a really good newsletter that is for patients by patients. It's not only for patients who've had their bladders removed, it's also for patients who've had bowel surgery. What's the best option for someone who's trying to decide where to go and where to head? It's really a patient's personal preference. Impact on lifestyle. Can you live with this? Can you live with that? And in many or most cases, it is up to the individual. But that person needs to spend some time with their urologist and the team to gather information and then make that decision, an informed decision with their family. That's it. Thank you very much.